Hi, I'm Jo Kane and welcome to One on One. I invited a number of city councillors to join me this week, but it appears they have gone to ground. So I have Ernest Deville from CORE. Hi Jo, how are you? Hi. Why was it necessary for CORE to be set up? Well, we felt that the, uh, the formulation of the city plan was occurring without um, the level of consultation that we felt was necessary from the building and property owners in the CBD. Because fundamentally the rebuild of the city will come from those building and property owners. So we wanted to make sure that their voice and their specific concerns um, were directly inputted into the planning process. OK. Now, who belongs to this group? Because we have the Chambers of Commerce and there seems sure. to be these two groups. So who belongs to this group? Well, that's a good question. There's a, there's a number of forums have sprung up over the city. Um, to become a member of our group, you simply have to be a building or a property owner, not a business person. You have to own real estate. We have 196 owners who collectively own between one and 2,000 buildings. And as far as we can ascertain, um, the collective value of those is around the three billion mark. So mm. um, we haven't lost any members. In fact, our membership is growing. In your initial drive uh, and submission process that you yes. went through with the minister, you you got his ire. You got his. Yes. He got you got him a little angry. He he thought you were doomsayers and looking for massive sub subsidies. He said his door was open. Have you met with the minister since? We haven't. Although we have written to the minister uh, requesting a meeting. Um, mm. I'd have to say that. I, I don't know how the submission was presented to him, whether he was caught off guard or whatever, but I'd like to say there's nothing in our submission in the way of seeking a subsidy. The reconstruction bonds that we alluded to, which we had a, a major international accountancy um, firm prepare for us, uh, was cost neutral to the government and cost neutral to the taxpayer. But that's how we saw the reconstruction funding occurring. OK. so. I guess everyone wants to know where will the funding for the rebuild come from, and what and what are the risks around it? Well, that's that's a that's the that's the million dollar question. The, the billion dollar question. <laughs> billion dollar um, question. Can I preface it by saying, firstly, the contact that we've had with um, some of the biggest banks in the country has uh, shown that there is not an appetite to lend money or to get an exposure into the CBD of Christchurch. Pete Townsend and Councillor Carter said that. Of the $30 billion rebuild bill, $10 billion will come from government for infrastructure and so forth, $20 billion from the private sector. Of the $20 billion, $10 billion will come from insurance and the other $10 billion from borrowings. At the moment there is a big gap there as to how that's going to be addressed. We've suggested that in the interim and until the commercial trading banks have an appetite to return to the city, that perhaps the appropriate entity to facilitate that funding is some sort of government involvement. We've suggested a reconstruction bond where the costs would be passed on to property owners, where the money would be securitised against landed buildings subject to certain terms and conditions. But that is the key thing, because unless property owners can get the funding to rebuild, they won't have enough money left under their insurance policies to actually rebuild the city. So the handout that was was the question that, that you're asking for. There's a number of mechanisms that you have put yes, as a group absolutely. to the government or to Sarah? Um, well, we've sent them <coughs> directly to the government and we've, we've put them on our website. We try and make as many people as possible aware of our website so that we can not only communicate to the authorities but also communicate to the wider community. We have a Facebook page, so we're, we're open to debate. If people don't think they're a good idea, we're more than happy to defend what we believe is the way forward. Uh, you know, people that have just in the red zone, residential yeah. red zone, might say, well, we're losing equity in, in our land through the package the government's given. Why should property owners be given any, any other special um, consideration? Well, how would you answer that? Well, people in the red zone, I mean, I understand what they're saying because I'm in the, I'm in the white zone and yes. my house was destroyed. Um, <laughs> But they have some level of certainty at this stage. They know precisely what they're going to get paid out. They have the benefit of um, basically subsidised loans from the ANZ at 3.65%. Now, if you contrast um, that with property owners in the CBD, they are running out of their loss of rents, which are going to fall off in September this year. They can't get any funding. The Under their full replacement policy, they are paying 
uh, the first payment goes to their bank, then they have to pay the demolition costs, then they have to pay the increase in construction costs, which are 26% since August, and the increase in the new code requirements, whatever they are. Coupled with that, they don't know what they can do or where they can do it until the new city plan is formulated, and even when that does come to light, they will need funding. So this, while there are similarities between the two groups, there are also some profound differences. So you started uh, talking about the demolition and, and whether that was fast enough or whether yes. you were engaged or whether you were involved. Has that sorted itself now? Is the demolition process fast enough or engaging enough or everyone knows what's going on? <laughs> well, I'd say that the demolition has certainly stepped up a pace since... Um, uh, the 13th. Yes. Um, so I think it's it's probably going um, at a pretty pretty good uh, speed at the moment. And Are there any hold hold ups to some of these buildings being demolished? Look, I don't know. I know, as everybody knows, there's the more complex buildings like the big buildings, but um, you know the some of the issues surrounding those buildings are very complex. Um, I mean, we 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 got at building tall buildings, but we're in completely new territory, sort of taking down you know, really tall buildings um, in a functioning city. So um, I think the demolitions are going in a fairly timely pace at the moment and, and that needs to happen because we need to get the city opened up as quickly as possible. Because it's gone quite quiet and so we haven't heard too much from the property owners that were crying foul, there'll be the old one. So it, it, there's a sense of calmness returned to that process. Well, I think everybody is dealing with issues. I mean, <clears throat> we're, we're still um, articulating the key points that are of a concern to all building owners, and those concerns will remain in place for um, many months, if not years. So the demolition phase is only the first chapter of a very long story. Um, it, is, it, it is a relatively minor um, phase. It might take another six months or so. The real big part is going to be the reconstruction. So those are the major issues we need to sort of um, address as a community if we want to see the city built. Okay, well I think we'll come back to the reconstruction okay. just right after this break. Sure. Welcome back. You're involved in the central city planning team. Yes. Are you now, your concerns and the concerns of the property owners, being listened to in that planning process? They're certainly being listened to. I mean, <clears throat> we've had some uh, very vigorous um, and direct discussions with the, the group. Um, they are in no doubt of the issues that are germane to the reconstruction of the city. Um, I mean, I've been a property developer and a property owner in the city for 27 years. Um, I've done many of the biggest developments in the city. I'm intimately familiar with the concerns of all property owners. And I think CORE has been very successful in articulating those key concerns. We're very passionate about the city. Every yes. dollar that people have borrowed in that city, there's a personal guarantee attached to that, every loan. Now these people have managed and owned these buildings for decades, so they are the appropriate people to be inputting into the central city plan about what should happen in the future. So I'm... Have you been able to get the city council to understand that you're more than just a stakeholder group? Because I want to hold, I want to hold this up, this, this plan, which is the Greater Christchurch Earthquake Governance Structure, mm -hmm. which is... Uh, it's complicated and it's complex yes. and and you are down here somewhere in this in this yellow yep. box are they understanding the actual property rights in the CBD that you have do you have a sense of confidence I have a sense that they are understanding it and the more we engage with them the greater the depth and uh, scope of their understanding um, and it's fair to say that um, the ideas in our submission are not unique to us they are arising from other groups as well, and that's very encouraging to hear. Um, everyone I speak to, they say, oh, I understand the issues now. So I'm very confident that they, are, they understand the key issues, and um, just whether they get adopted into the wider plan is another question altogether. And, and what will happen if they don't? Because that's been the question, is that the bureaucrats are running the show, and that out of these plans could come things drawn over people's property. Yes, well, I mean, 
<clears throat> the thing is, we've always said that the city plan has to be credible. It's got to be exciting enough to engage businesses and property owners. It has to be achievable because, you know, it's e the, the creating a vision for the city is easy, but it's actually bringing it to fruition. So you need issues like what are the incentives, what are the, what are the funding, um, what's the time frame? Because you can leave everything to the open market and we can rebuild the city over a much longer period of time. Or you can put some incentives in place, provide some funding and build it over a shorter period of time. The dividend for the community in general and the country at large is very significant. We've, we're losing a thousand buildings. You consider that each building probably had three or four businesses in them yes. and maybe half a dozen people working in each business. That's the cost. So the faster we can restore the city, get the businesses back in, get jobs, get employment, get growth and wealth, the better we all, we're all off. A big part <clears> of this is also the tourist revival. Yep. How, how do you think that should be driven? Well, I think it's a, it's a big concern because we're losing so many hotels. I mean, if you look at the CBD, we're losing Hotel Grand Chancellor. Whilst that's being demolished, Four Seasons next door, Centra over the road can't function. Oak Stay down Cashel Street can't function. We're potentially losing two Copthorne Thorn hotels. Crown, uh, Crown Plaza is out of action for two, two and a half years, mm -hmm. Fino Casamenti. Yep. So we, we're going to have a shortage of accommodation. We've got a beautiful new airport. Um, we're, we're involved, because we developed Pacific Tower, which has got a 171 room hotel in it, and also the Cathedral Junction Complex, which has two hotels. We are, we've got a facilitator to promote that area in conjunction with New Regent Street uh, to try and get that as an accommodation hub going to complement the Cashelmore Restart program and then to try and link them together so that the city actually has accommodation for visitors. So, so is the <coughs> Cashel Street Restart, is that still on target? Is that a reality I in, don't know. in regard to the. You don't know? It's a SERA initiative. Yes. Um, so I don't know how the recent earthquake on the 13th has affected their program, but I do know that there's a strong commitment to get that going, and and we support that because it's you've got to sort of focus on a part of the city, try and get that up and running as quickly as possible. But we also feel that it's important to identify other parts of the city where you have intact infrastructure and try and get those parts um, up and running and then join them together. You must be getting some feedback from some of your investors and the developers and mm. the property owners about their intentions for reinvesting in the city. Yes. Are they going to stay <clears throat> here or is the timing just too difficult for them? Well, you'll get some who, who will stay here irrespective. Um, there's already some who are moving, because not because they want to, but because they have to. Because as I said before, um, when their loss of rents stops, they, their yes, income yes. stops. Mm. They have no ability to support their families. Now, I spoke to one owner yesterday and he has bought property outside of Christchurch because his loss of rent stops in September. He has to restore his income. He's got no choice. So he can't wait. Now, <clears throat> there's, I know of um, other companies that are taking their money and they're building houses out in the, uh, the west because whilst they may want to stay and commit to the, the rebuild of the city, it's simple economics. If they haven't got any income, they don't have the luxury of, of waiting. So, so is that the difficulty of the city plan, is that it's got to be back, I think, in the government's hand by December and then we're into Christmas, New yes. Year type stuff, that the actual timing, uh, 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 does the government and Sarah understand that, that the problem that that actually f faces business people and property owners? Look, I think they do. Um, there's <clears throat> Firstly, we have to allow sufficient time to ventilate all the issues around the city plan. It's such a big issue, we've got to get it right. Um, you, you can't really hurry the process. We also have to accept that there is an issue with landlords whose income is going to expire. So what do we do? We've suggested that perhaps perhaps there, somewhere in there we need to try and retain those property owners in the city um, by giving them some financial incentive mm. to st stick around. Because when you think about it, the amount of money you might need to pay them to keep them, to give them some income, if they are providing a commitment to invest millions of dollars back in the city, then they may be prepared to do that. And that may be a small price to pay to keep that level of investment in the city. 
there'll be some who just say, look, you know, we, we just want to spread our risk. Um, we don't necessarily want to have all our eggs in one basket. So the issue is complicated, but there needs to be some mechanism to address those issues and to say to owners, look, we think you should stick around, even if it's something like saying we're going to provide some funding, we're going to provide these um, incentives or we're going to make it easier for you. There needs to be something communicated to them sooner rather than later to avoid the flight of that capital, which has is, is already started, and you, you can't do anything about that. Yeah, no, that's a bit of a worry for the city. We'll yes. be right back after this break. Hi. It seems to be that since Sarah and Roger Sutton got put into place, people have gone a little bit quiet, a little bit nervous about speaking out about anything. Has CORE had its wings clipped a little bit? Well, no, not really. It's just that, um, I mean, I, I guess sort of Roger has recently come into the driving seat. Um, a lot of the, I guess, the, um, the anxiety that people have had has been... Um, addressed. I mean, you've had 5,000 people in the eastern suburbs who have a degree of certainty now. So that sort of calmed a lot of people down. Um, there's been an acceleration of the um, demolition process. We as a group are now directly in, engaged with the uh, strategic inner city building owners and properties group, plus with the CCP. So we are feeling we're getting some level of airing. Um, I mean, so you're saying that people are really now starting to work together? To a much greater degree. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, we've, we've had these successive earthquakes. Mm -hmm. We're in new territory. There's been a settling down process. Um, people are starting to sort of um, find their place in the structure, if you like. Um, it's not a perfect system. Mm. I mean, we're learning as we go. When we make um, submissions and recommendations, we're picking up things that perhaps are not so clear um, underneath the CERA legislation. We're saying, well, here's an issue here and here's an issue here. We're not bagging anybody. We're just saying, um, look, this is an issue that we think needs to be addressed. But at the end of the day, we don't have any power to change that. We, we like everyone else in Christchurch, are under the authority of CERA. You're under the authority of mm. CERA. We all are. So what we're doing is we're trying to bring to the authorities' attention, and that's the City Council, that's um, the Central City Planning Team, that's Sarah. We're trying to bring to their attention issues that we see in much more detail that they should be aware of, and that's our function. Now, that's not going to stop. We will we will keep doing that um, for the months and the years to come. You, you talk about both the property owners and business being in quite a precarious financial position. What are the other impediments that they have, yeah, or what what can be initiated almost under urgency to to get a bit of this impetus going? Well, I would like to um, I would like to see perhaps um, some words of encouragement to property owners um, to suggest to them that they they should be staying um, in the city. They have been. Who do, you, who do you believe should lead that? Because we have, of course, we have Sarah. But we also have the city council. Who should be leading that well, confidence a, that we should have in the city? Well, there's a number of there's a number of people in senior position who have been sort of um, you know draped with the mantilla of responsibility um, to make those utterances. I mean, at the end of the day, we're a lobby group, um, just like business groups and everyone else, and we're saying, well, these are the specific concerns. I mean, we want to positively engage in in a, in a way that says, hey, these are some concerns. In our submissions, we've not just put forward the issues, we've put forward what we consider to be the solutions. And but but you've, tried, you've said to us that it's, you're more than just a stakeholder group. You actually yep. own That's the right. land. You actually have a huge investment in here. Are you, do you have confidence with the, city, the leadership at the City Council, and I'm talking about the Council table, in, in some of the information <laughs> that's come out of there this week? Well, they've certainly got some issues that they need to resolve, and... What I would do is I would encourage them to resolve those in a timely manner because as a city um, and as a community, we're not going to be able to move forward unless we're galvanised um, across all these issues. There's too much to lose for us not to uh, be working together and making a fist of it. And I haven't been following um, some of the information in a great deal of detail, 
but clearly, and I know I speak for all the property owners, they need to get that sorted out pretty quickly. You talked about retaining people and capital. You must have highlighted something that could be done urgently, you know, that something that could be done. And you've talked about giving the confidence. Who yep. has to give the confidence to the business? The city council or Sierra or the government? Well, well or... I think it's probably, I think it's the, the, it's the people who can actually make um, the right sort of decisions. I mean, it's going to be at a governmental level, I would suggest, because at the moment, um, what is the, what's the response in terms of funding? How are we going to be funded? Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, some sort of a government facilitated uh, funding package. I mean, I was in the CBD with a senior banker the other day, <clears throat> and I said, would you lend in the CBD? And he said, no. And I said, well, what would be the conditions that you would lend? And he said, we would want a government guarantee. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, well, that would be um, difficult to come by. And he said, well, the government could charge 1%, as it did with the finance companies. He said, we could then on charge that to the borrower. And he said, in all probability, the cost of borrowing would be less because of the quality of the instrument. So the bank could still manage risk. The mm -hmm. government wouldn't be putting up the money but it would be enhancing that security because the key thing is not long-term funding for the reconstruction, but medium-term funding. funding. If you can fund property owners to rebuild in the city, to build new buildings to the new code, they can achieve sustainability standards and all the rest, then, and if there's a, a, an exit strategy within, say, three, four, five years, the trading banks can come back in and refinance that out. Because so, you believe that there's a time to be a leader in these unique positions, to be innovative in how we lead the building. But how difficult is the earthquake strengthening rules and new building codes? That's an added cost yes. to just the knowns. How difficult is that going to be? Well, we don't know because at the moment the Tonkin and Taylor are doing completing the land report. That's yes. going to come out pretty soon. <clears throat> and that is a geological mapping of the CBD. In fact, there, there's a land report for the whole of the Christchurch area. So that's the first thing that has to be established, is what lies beneath. The second thing is that each particular building, that's um, each site that's built on, you'll need to have a specific geotech report. And that's that's going to have an impact upon what you can build there. If there's a height restriction... That geotech report's due when? Well, the land report is due out fairly soon. But once you've, as a property owner, once you've got the land report, that's just the start. That'll talk about general, the, the geotech generally across the city. If you want to build on a specific site, you'll have to get a specific geotech report on that site based on what you intend to build. And then the engineer will take that geotech data and then he will design your piles and your foundations and all the rest. So property owners can't really move forward until they have all that information. Boy, that's, yeah. go that's certainly going to be the big one when that comes out that people are going to be looking at. Hey, Ernest, thank you very much for coming in today. It's right, a pleasure. Um, and going one-on-one -on -one with me. Uh, and that's it for this week.